Any of you that know me well know that I am a fanatic about guitar tone, pretty much certifiable. And so I thought it might be fun to make a video uh, uh, listing a few of the nutty things I've done over the years in search of getting a great tone. Uh, the first thing, and, and by the way, I, when I was 13 or 14 and I heard the, um, the British Invasion, Clapton and and Cream, you know, and uh, and Led Zeppelin and and whatnot. I immediately, and I was a drummer at this point, but I immediately began to listen to guitar tone, and had an opinion uh, always about what was good tone and what what was not. And even before I had switched to guitar from drums, I had actually built a system. And what I did was uh, I had this uh, a tape recorder that. In, in those days, that would have been the kind of tape recorder you'd see in a school. It was a seven-inch reel uh, and a, a thing about maybe, oh, I don't know, a foot and a half wide and the same height, or the, the same uh, from front to back, and then it sat on a table on its back. And one day, I had the mic plugged into it, and one day I pushed the red record button that you would you'd have to hold that down and then you'd press play and it would begin to record but this particular time I pressed the red button and when it got down to a certain point I, there was a tiny bit of feedback so I knew that that sound was coming out of that speaker right away and I realized that's an amplifier and so the, the problem was that you could only you could only get that to happen if you push the red button down just so far and I mean it was you know, a sixteenth of an inch too far and you've lost it. So what I did was I took a little piece of brass stripping, a little piece of metal, and I bent it and, and mounted it so that if I, and drilled a couple holes in the tape recorder face, and then I would screw this little uh, piece of brass down on top of the red button, and I would just turn the screwdriver until all of a sudden there there it came, I could hear it. And so essentially I had an amplifier. And so it had a quarter inch input, the tape recorder. And of course that's the same uh, you know, type of plug that's used on a guitar cable. So I plugged my guitar into this thing and it worked. And I loved it because I, you know, it was the first time I'd ever been amplified. And the only problem was, of course it, it didn't sound that good in retrospect and there were no tone controls, there was no way to change the amount of treble or anything. But it was, you know, at least getting an, a guitar through an amplifier live. So, uh, so I uh, decided I wanted it to be louder. And in this house, old farmhouse I was living in, there was an old, I think it was a Grundig, that was the brand, like a, a hi-fi system. It was, it was big. It stood probably four feet tall, maybe two and a half feet wide, and it held a turntable and a radio, and then it had a great big speaker, probably like a 15-inch speaker in the, in the bottom section of it. And so I said, there's got to be a way to get the signal from the tape recorder to this radio, you know. And so I, I looked on the back of the, of the Grundig, and sure enough, there was an auxiliary input. Uh, and so you could plug something in there. And so I took uh, the output of the tape recorder, and I don't remember how I did it, but somehow I got the output of the tape recorder, I probably opened it up and tapped into the wires on the speaker. That's probably what I did. And then I sent that signal to the, to the radio. And of course, the voltages were all wrong and everything. So it was so distorted, so overdriven that I was in heaven. That's exactly what I wanted. And so I actually, in metal or in wood shop in, in school, I don't know if it was junior high or high school at this point. Uh, I, I think it was high school. I uh, built a large wooden cabinet and I covered it with white Tolex, which is what most guitar amps are covered in, although normally it's black. And then I just stuck, I made a shelf inside the uh, this big cabinet and the tape recorder would sit on the shelf and then the, the, the Grundig big radio thing would go in the bottom of this of this cabinet. And I didn't secure it or anything, it was just sitting in there. And we actually took that to gigs. Now, I, I was still playing drums, so in the band, when we would do a gig, the guitar player didn't have an amp, so he used this thing. And to my amazement, it never failed. It never, nothing ever went wrong with it. I mean, I've seldom had amps where, where nothing ever went wrong. And this would have been the most kludgy thing you could possibly imagine, and nothing happened to it. So uh, that was just one 
nutty idea I had, which, you know, as far as it went, it was fine. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have uh, proven to be anything that really professionally useful. But so uh, then I noticed that I did not like the sound of a speaker pointed right at me. That was the worst sound. The, um, the, the sound of a speaker, which is especially a guitar amp, which is a very bright, trebly sound, with that pointing straight at you, it's an ugly sound because the treble has a tendency to beam. The, the uh, tr bass frequencies radiate out in all directions, but treble goes in a line like a laser. And so I thought, well, uh, maybe I don't want to have the speaker pointed right at me. So what I, but I thought, well, how can I get it so it's not pointed directly at anybody in the room? And I realized the only way to do that was to point it at the ceiling. And it just so happened that I had something that was fairly high off the floor. I don't know what it was, but it had to be four or five feet high. And I took my, this cabinet that I was using and I set it on its back on top of this, whatever it was, table or whatever. And I aimed it straight at the ceiling. And I played like that for about a year. And I loved it because it was all ambient sound. There was, it was, I was in a room in an old schoolhouse and the sound was very live in there and it just sounded glorious and I loved it. Um, then uh, another way of getting around the problem of the, uh, the brightness, I'm watching the clock here, uh, is because uh, I decided that I could make a speaker box that would, would get rid of that beaminess in the high end. You know, uh, and so I made what turned out to be called a folded horn. I didn't even know this. And here's a diagram of, of how it, it, essentially how it looked. You're looking at top view, and so the the speaker inside the cabinet is actually aimed toward the back, and then I put a, a kind of a, a, a V-shaped baffle, or a reverse V-shaped baffle, and the sound would reflect off of that, and then it would come out the front of the cabinet to the sides of the speaker. And I, I just came up with this idea on my own, but I found out later that it was a, a known design. It was called a folded horn, and uh, the um, bass amps of the 70s, the Acoustic 360, was exactly this principle. And I had the, the terrible uh, ignorance to take this thing to a gig. I was opening up for Maria Moldar at, in the, at the Keystone Berkeley, and I took this speaker box with me, untested, never had tried it outside of my bedroom, and I didn't bring anything else. And it sounded absolutely hideous, and I had to do this whole set that we did opening up for Maria with this terrible tone. And that taught me an important lesson, which is that always bring what you know will work with you. You may not use it. You might be trying out a new amp or a new pedal or something, but you never know how it's going to feel on the gig. So I, I learned an important lesson, which is always take your, your rig that you know that's tried and true that you can fall back on no matter what else is you're trying and how convinced you are that this new thing is going to be better don't count on it because I've, I've learned through painful experience that something can sound incredible in your bedroom and you get it on the gig and it doesn't sound anything like that um, then let's see then the next thing was uh, I was in a nightclub uh, I was 21 I think and playing in Denver in nightclubs and there was uh, we were on break and the house music was on. And a waitress came over and she turned this knob that was mounted in the middle of a wall, it turned it counterclockwise, and the volume of the house music went down. And being technically minded, I realized, okay, that control she's, she just turned is not what you call a line level device. It isn't, it isn't controlling the, the amplifier that they were putting the house music through. It had to be controlling the speaker. And so I said, well, if such a thing exists, I could use it with my guitar amp, and I because what you want to do with a guitar amp, you want to crank it because that's when it sounds good, but normally it's too loud. So this uh, L pad, it's called, would uh, was a device that would limit the amount of current that got to the speaker. So you could adjust the amp so that it sounded perfect. You got the great tone, and then the the speaker volume was controllable with this. I started using that in 1976. I'm still using them to this day. I make a, a version I call the Marriage Counselor. Uh, Tina Abbasade named that. And it is just a speaker volume control. And it, it's, to this day, it's the best solution I've found to the problem, even though I've spent 
you know, a thousand dollars or more on commercial models that are purport to do the same thing, but they never sound as good. Um, let's see. Then uh, another thing I did was I would try out different pickups on my guitars. Now I have a Stratocaster. This is the Strat I played with Miles Davis, and you'll notice that the if I can get it in there, the output jack is on the the pick guard. It's not on the body where it normally is on a Stratocaster. It's right here. And so that means that all the electronics are contained on the pick guard. And so I wanted to try some new pickups, but I knew by that point that I couldn't count on them sounding good to me. So I said, well, I don't want to go through a whole night with, with pickups that are not happening. And so I bought another pick guard, mounted the new pickups and all the electronics I needed, uh, and uh, and installed it in the guitar with the knowledge that if I had to change the, the pickups back to the original ones, I could do it quite quickly. All it meant was uh, loosen the strings, undo about um, eight or nine screws, remove the, um, the pick guard, pop the new one in, and hit the ground running. And I did that. Uh, I think it was at Barney Steele's in Redwood City. And I played... Um, uh, the first set with the new pickups that I was hoping would sound good, they did not. And so on the break, I did that, switched out the, the pick guard, and still had time to get a beer, and then went up and played the, sec the rest of the night with my usual tone. So, you know, there's a few things that I've done that are kind of out there. I'm sure you've probably never heard anybody else talk about stuff like that. But I've always had a, a, a great interest in getting a, a truly great tone, and I... I struggle to this day with it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I will never be completely satisfied. I'm sure of that. But it's fun to try different things, and you learn something every time. So anyway, hope this was interesting for you.